All right, we are here with another uh, episode of Cascading Leadership. Welcome to the show. I am your host, uh, Jim. And I'm your host, Lawrence Brown. Hello, Lawrence Brown. So today we have our a second featured guest on the show and uh, big pressure for this guest. You are the first female leader on the show. So you are the spokesperson for an entire gender. So, no, just kidding. So welcome to the show. We have Sarah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks. First female anything I think is exciting. So I'll take it. So my name is Sarah Odess. I live just in a suburb outside of Columbus, Ohio, the head of leadership development at JLL, a humongous commercial real estate firm. And uh, yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. We are really pumped with you being here. And I think what's interesting so far, as far as the show goes, you're the second featured guest that we have. So all of the episodes that have been released so far has just been about Lawrence and we're already getting some pretty decent traction, which is always good, but we can't wait to see what happens when our featured guests start taking center stage. So for the folks that have already downloaded episodes and checked us out, you can find us on all sorts of your favorite podcast platforms. The feedback that we've gotten so far has been positive. If you are following and subscribing to the show, make sure you get us feedback so we can actually improve. If you have topic ideas or guest ideas, make sure you get that to us as well. So Sarah, big pressure, big pressure. We got your high level background and now it's story time. So tell us your story, Sarah. So let's start at the beginning. Oh my gosh, the beginning. If I think about what really formed who I am and how I got to where I am, it's probably a lot to do with the influence of my parents, as I know most of us could say, right? For me, what might make me unique compared to those that I grew up with or other females of my generation, I grew up in a really small rural town where most folks' career paths started right after high school. They may have just you know, started working at the local factory. Most of their parents did the same thing. If I look at a lot of the women that I graduated high school with, teachers, nurses, very clear paths for them. And for me, though, I grew up seeing my mom as the breadwinner. She was a school administrator. She was a principal and she not only had the more career focus of my two parents, my dad floated around to different things and had, I would say a certain degree of instability in his career, but my mom was always the one holding down the fort, not only a leader of a school, but carried a lot of accolades. She won some awards and just very professional and very like uh, a pillar of the community. So to see my mom in a leadership position like that as from the earliest memories that I have, I think, honestly, that's probably opened up different paths for me and made me kind of question what was really possible and not necessarily follow the same paths as a lot of my, my peers did, especially my female peers that I recall growing up with and going to grade school and high school with. So I think just having that really strong professional female in my home gave me the courage to pursue other things. As an undergrad, I majored in psychology and I don't know that I ever had a idea of what kind of career I could carve out for myself in a, a bachelor's in psychology, but it wasn't until, I don't know, maybe my third year or so, I started exploring what kind of grad school paths would look like. There was even a point I think where my dad was urging me to, why don't you just take a safe path? And we live a half a mile from this factory down the road. Why don't just go get a job there and have benefits and not worry about all of these different paths or opportunities that could be totally hypothetical at this point. And I wasn't okay with that. I was never okay with that. So I just kept pushing and trying different things until I found my path forward in the grad school of industrial organizational psychology. I had never heard of, nor had anyone I had ever grown up with. It was something I just fell into through one of my professors in undergrad, and he suggested I take a look at it, get an old textbook and, and figure out what it is. I know we don't have any courses to offer you, but it seems like it could be a path forward for you. And not to mention, you could go that corporate side of a career rather than academic, like I had always seen. My parents were both 
in education. And I thought that I wanted to be a teacher and I ruled that out. I would say probably right after high school, my dad dissuaded me pretty strongly from going into that same careers that my parents did because it was getting to be more complicated to be a teacher than ever before. We look at things now and it's as complicated as ever, but even back then, 20 years ago, they could start to see that things were going to be harder for teachers than it was when they entered the profession. And I think my dad also wanted me to be a little more fiscally aware of what career paths were out there for me. Go do something that makes a more comfortable lifestyle for yourself. So I really didn't know what I wanted to do until I found IO Psychology. There is a ton to unpack there, and I don't want to speed up into college and grad school just yet, but there's yeah. something that, that you mentioned really early on when, when you just started talking about, Hey, your first view or your first perception. And I don't even know if it was intentional at that level of what you could potentially become was from your mom mm -hmm. and the role that she had as principal, but certainly an educator, but a uh, role in the community, all that sort of stuff. Now, a lot of what your journey, or at least what you think could be possible is shaped eh, oftentimes by the vision that's revealed to you by other people. And when you talk about your mom, there was an element of that, but was she intentional in sharing that vision or was it just through observation that you picked this up? I, I don't think it was intentional for her to put her, position herself as a role model for my career. To be honest, my mom is the oldest daughter of six siblings. And I think from a very young age had to be a leader uh, amongst her peers and had to take that type of a role in every situation that she was in her entire life. She fell into education. It was a natural path for her. A lot of her peers probably became teachers and she had a passion for that administrator position. She got a master's degree, which was unique for her generation as well as females, I think, in, from her background. I, I, I just see my mom as somebody who always pursued more. And although she stayed in the same career and worked for the same diocese, she was in a, a Catholic school her entire career, she stayed there for 30 plus years. I don't know that my mom would have described herself as a career-driven person, but her example alone intentionally or unintentionally did form what I, what I could see for myself as possible. I, I saw her in a leadership position. I saw her command an audience, whether it be the, the students or a, a group of parents, it didn't matter who she was in front of my mom at the, the raise of a hand or the, the look in her eye, create a direction for a massive amount of people. And that to me was, it was so powerful to watch her do that. And I thought that she was just the ultimate powerful person that I, I got to watch every single day because I went to school with her. So I got to see her in action in those large groups of people all the time. I'm a clown and I'm grinning right now when you mentioned look. So I've spent quite a bit of time in Catholic school. <laughs> I went to a Catholic high school. Actually, even in India, we have boarding schools in India and I was sent to a boarding school, but it's not boarding school. The U.S. thinks it's a boarding school. It's closer to like prison camp. And the boarding school that I went to in India was super old school. We're talking the nuns had the habits on that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I've gotten principal nuns that gave me that look. And then when I came to the U.S., I was in Catholic school all through high school. I've been the recipient of that look. So when you said your mom had the look and the command, I know it. That's yeah. She can still give it to me today. And I, I fall in line. <laughs> There's something, it's this silent power, but also if you think about it, it's that ability to lead with just grace and a quiet strength that I admire, to be honest. And I, I try to emulate her style, not only in my career, but also in raising my kids and just any opportunity that I have to be the voice of direction or a position. I find myself emulating her. Sarah, it's interesting because when you say uh, emulating, so far, we're not that far into our shows, but something that has emerged when we talk about our beginnings is this idea of emulation. It's interesting because I think the emulation is perhaps equally or more important in our leadership journey that we want to model after someone. And, and, and we look up to our parents and for the most part in most instances. And when you describe some of how you saw your mother 
you also carry through to, and this is the way actually that I have decided that I want to raise my own children and the way that I pursue my own career or that when you had the opportunity to see that work ethic, you had the opportunity to see that a commitment, right? Not only in the community, but in your home, I think you described a little bit too. And so you had that well-rounded perspective and it's just powerful to hear your story and definitely interested in hearing more about how that's shaped the rest of your journey. Probably wasn't even until Jim and I started having these conversations that I even recognized how much power my mom had in forming my career and giving me a perspective to challenge the way that I could have directed my schooling and approach to building a career that's not just the same role for 30 years in the same company or, or factory. I'm very comfortable saying yes to many different new opportunities. I think even though that's not necessarily what she did, she set me up to have that confidence. Digging in a little bit on the, I don't want to go down the road of what's expected. The path you mentioned, the path within the town that you grew up in is linear. Mm -hmm. You pick one of these three paths. One of them is working in the factory. What was it about that predetermination or even predestination didn't appeal to you? Where, where did that come from? My dad had, he had a career that took him back and forth between education. So he would go and he would teach. He was a, a junior high science teacher. He would get really burnt out after a few years, understandably. And then he would find himself in a factory. He would go and take a different job in a different plant doing manual labor in between those teaching stints. And it looked really unpleasant, to be honest. He worked really hard. He worked second shift sometimes, which means I didn't get to see him very much. He worked in one factory where he produced the fiberglass lighting of vehicles and he would come home with these terrible sores and cuts and just wounds on his hands that he couldn't heal. And for years and years, he worked in the same factory and he had the same terrible outbreak of sores on his hands. And I just thought, I can't do that. I don't have the, I'm not tough enough to do that, to be honest. And he never really seemed super fulfilled or happy. It was a job. It was a means to an end. And I, then I saw my mom who is so passionate about what she did. And she didn't do it for the money. That's for sure. She did it because this was her calling. And my mom is somebody who truly believes in vocations and seeing her so dedicated to her career and willing and able to go above and beyond because she believed in what she was doing. Gosh, that was a path I wanted to go down. I wanted to feel that more so than the exhaustion and the physical aches and pains and ailments that I saw my dad experience in that manual labor factory profession. And I think to me, it was like, I'm going to close that door really early on in my planning for my future. And I don't know if it's going to be education or something else for me, but I want to find something that makes me as passionate about what I do as my mom is about what she does. And so for me, I think it was a really young age seeing my dad work second shift. Maybe once a month, he would come and take me out to lunch during school. There was a special arrangement where he could come and we would go to the local cafe in the little town that I went to school with school in. And that was like the quality time that I got with him because his sleeping hours were opposite mine. And I just didn't want that lifestyle for my future. And it just looked really hard in every way. That was a great question, Jim. And I think that you provided an even better answer. So it sounds like you, you had this whole idea of with the factory piece, like you burn the ship, like there's no, there's, I'm not going down that path. But I think that there's also the flip side where the two help to drive some of what you, what you've become, because you talked about the vocation piece and seeing and that creating a sense of drive. Yeah, I think so. My mom is somebody who never turned off her focus on her school and her dedication to the parents and the, the students that she supported. Sometimes I think like maybe it would have been nice to take a job where you clock in, you clock out and you don't take anything home with you, but I don't know that I would be fulfilled. I don't know that I would have that deep connection to what I do if I had a job like that. Sometimes I think it would be way easier, especially now as I'm raising two toddlers. Maybe that would be nice, right? At this difficult kind of uh, juncture that I'm in in my personal life, but I'm not that kind of person where I, I would just want to work for a paycheck. I'm not a means to an end kind of person. And 
that's the two dichotomies that I saw in my parents growing up. And I want to feel like the work I'm doing means something. I'm making a difference in whatever community or organization I'm working for. And I don't mind going that extra mile, going above and beyond, giving a bit more of myself than just that nine to five or shift work. I know that uh, Lawrence is going to be chiming in on something in just a second, but take uh, a quick pause and just call out something that's coming out of the conversation. So obviously this show is focused on telling the stories of women, immigrants, people of color who have risen to leadership roles, the lessons that they've learned and, and, and what they've passed on. The more conversations that I have and even the, the shows that we do, one of the things that starts becoming really clear is that even though this show and the conversations have a strong DEI bent, it becomes more and more clear how much common ground that all of us share. Because if I didn't know your backstory or your parents' backstory, you're basically telling the story of an immigrant coming over. It's the work, maybe an unfulfilling job because it's a means to an end because the goal is to give your kids a better life. And what you just shared about your dad, and thanks for sharing, is right in line a lot of what's common with first generation immigrants that come over. My worldview is that if we want to move the needle on any of these things, we have to establish common ground and work forward from what makes us similar versus just camping out in the areas that were different. So that's a great perspective that you shared as far as how your dad's experience closed off a door in terms of what you wanted to do. I think that's, he's probably happy that he did. Oh, without a doubt. I think there was some, there was a bit of stability in it that he wanted me to pursue because he saw me a little directionless in undergrad. So at, at one point, I think he was like, let's just pull the, the lifeline and say, go get a job, please just get a job. I need you to be stable and self-sufficient. But looking back, if he could see me now, he would be beyond thrilled that I was patient, that I did explore different opportunities. He was the one who explicitly told me not to go into education. I will never forget that. It was my high school graduation party, actually. And uh, I was talking to somebody and they asked, what are you majoring in? And I said, early education. It makes sense. That's what my parents did. That's what I'm going to do. And he walked up and he's like, she's undecided. And I said, no, I'm going early education. He goes, you need to pick a different something else. And so I was undecided for probably two years because I had always thought I would be a teacher like my mom and my dad even. like he, His profession was education. He just went in and out of it. So I floundered for a bit and I guess I'm glad I did. I know patience is something that has served me well in my life and my career. I'm beyond grateful that he dissuaded me from the more traditional paths or the path that he chose for himself, honestly. I was thinking that you, when you were talking about the, the quote unquote floundering, one of the things that I think that we do to children unintentionally is that here's the famous question that we all get. What do you want to be when you grow up? Who can answer that? Sometimes. <laughs> We're 25, 30 still answering that question. I think that it's very brave, number one, I think, of your dad to do that, to say, no, it's undecided. And then he actually circled back and said, okay, you're still undecided. <laughs> Let's shore this up. <laughs> and I do agree that some of the things that are similar. So when uh, we had our last guest on, he had talked about some of the things that were being of West Indian background, there's certain professions that you go into. And you were talking about in your family and in your community, you were saying along the lines of, and I think Jim mentioned this too earlier, about this correlation between what we, that we have more in common than we have dissimilar. How has that helped to create a sense of perspective as you think about engaging with others? And I did cheat a little bit. I went back and, and, and I looked at your background. And so you're big into uh, human development. I'm interested in hearing how you, how that has influenced how you have wound up in the space you are in today. Because I thought I was going to be a teacher, I still found myself in a career and there's so many parallels I even draw every day in what I do as similar to what teachers do. I happen to be in a learning and development role right now, obvious translation. I've applied the same passion for teaching and, and educating people. It's just, an, it's just at work. It's just not in a a university or a school setting. Sure. So it's not that I've chosen something that I wasn't always passionate about. I just found a different avenue to display that same skill and that same interest in creating an environment where I get to upskill people. And I've gotten into a path where I'm focused 
primarily on leadership skills. So it's just, it all found its way into my career. It just didn't happen to be the path that I thought it was going to be in a traditional education academic background. And now I work at a commercial real estate firm, which feels so different than where I was previously. I was at a manufacturing organization and in that company, they made a uh, plastic pipe and they have their roots in, in agriculture, right? They were the ones who created the first plastic pipe that would be replacing what quote unquote tile as what fi farmers call it. That was exciting to me because my family comes, both sides of my family come from a farming background. So when I told them where I worked and I worked for a manufacturing organization and that we made tile, I had an instant connection to my roots of agriculture and farming. Like I grew up playing on my uncle's farm with my cousins. And so I've always tried to find work and some sort of connection that still I'm still who I always was. And it wasn't that I had to completely transform what I like to do and what I'm passionate about or the industries I'm in. I always find something that roots me back to where I came from and my family. And it, I think that's what keeps me tied to and dedicated to an organization or my job. Awesome. Sometimes we find ourselves in these jobs if we don't actually have that intentionality of we're just collecting a paycheck and not having that uh, that sense of, of purpose. And I think that's an important element to have. And since the majority of our conversations are really about leadership, there is that intentionality that becomes important around guiding what your career is going to ultimately become. If I were to have scripted my career when I was little and said, do I want to be a leadership development L and D specialist? No, I don't know what that is. When I was, right. I remember when I was little, I was obsessed with Peter Pan and somebody asked me what I wanted to be. I always said pirate. I wanted to be a pirate. I thought that lifestyle looked so fun. My mom loves that. I had that answer as a little kid. And even now you gave the example, like we ask children what they want to be when they grow up. And my son deviates from a firefighter to a pilot. Right? I would love for him to choose either of those things, but what's the likelihood that he does? Pretty unlikely. You just mentioned something that I think that's also a key element as we think about those of us that are parents and developing the next generation is that the role that you have didn't even exist, at least in your mind. And so for some of these young people today, the roles that they'll take on don't even exist. So we're asking them, what do you want to be? Like data scientists have been around for a very long time, but I know that for my generation, I don't know that that was necessarily one of 10 things you were going to say that you were going to be when you would, when you would grow up. No. One of the other interesting aspects of the story, Sarah, is that within your community, when you were growing up, there are defined paths. As important as it is to say, hey, this is what I want to be when I grow up, I think it's important, it's worth mentioning, you should probably start building the list from what don't I want to do. Then that gets you into that magic wand mindset. If mm -hmm. I can wave a wand and create my ideal next role, what does that look like? There's this push-pull within your family. On the one hand, you've had voices say, why don't you opt for the secure option, clock in, clock out. And then to a certain degree, you have your dad advising you, don't take the safe option. You might want to go the safe option, but just not these safe options. How did you start figuring out what's the pathway that is available to me? What was it that opened your eyes to something other than what was available in your small rural mm -hmm. community? I think you're hitting on something that around, I eliminated what I didn't want really early on. And whether I made those choices for myself or my dad ruled them out for me. But then when I was an undergrad as a psych major, I started to really panic at some point to say, I don't know how I'm going to make this a career. I, I don't know how you go get a psychology job that doesn't really exist with a bachelor's degree. And so what I started to do was figure out that I had to go to grad school, but you have to pick even a track within psychology in order to go to grad school. And so I had an amazing experience at a, a small university and the professors knew my name and I made sure that I was somebody that they wanted to work with. So I started working in their labs as an undergrad. And I think I worked in five different labs. I, I did everything from training mice to hunt out specific scents in cups of sand so that they would get a reward. And then we would lesion their hippocampus to see if they would remember the scent and the reward. And I knew it was like, okay, I don't really want to build a career doing these kinds of things, these kinds of experiments. I did social psychology, team studies, and I liked that. And I thought maybe social psychology was my path for a while. I did some things in the development psych lab. I, mean, I was everywhere. I just really, I, I wanted to rule stuff out. And I started to rule more and more 
paths for, I didn't want to do clinical psych. I, I just feel like I didn't have the emotional capacity to do clinical psych, far too much of an empath to, to do that. I worried about my own well being if I took that direction. So the social psych path really appealed to me the most, but I didn't necessarily know that I wanted to be a professor or a researcher. I was nervous to take that as my single direction of opportunity if I went into a grad program for social psych. And it was my advisor at the time who turned me on to the idea of industrial organizational psychology. And we didn't have a professor doing that. We didn't have an undergrad course in IO psych, but what he suggested was that could be the path because it gives you the applied career option or the academic career option. So if you're going to go to grad school and you just aren't ready to close all the doors or pick a certain single direction, at least this would keep some doors open for you. And social psych has a lot of parallels to psychology in the workplace. And so I credit Dr. Jackson at, at my university for turning me on to this idea of industrial organization organizational psychology. And it was through the process of elimination, really, that I found myself in grad school for that. So you talked about your parents being an influence and you just mentioned the professor as also being an, an influence as a balancing point of sorts to help you sort out what your next direction could look like and how important it was that you were actually listening. I'm a huge fan of emotional intelligence, right? And exercising that as best we possibly can. And I think it was great that you had a sense of knowing your limitations. To me, it's a better question of understanding your boundaries. When you say knowing your limitations, I think that's language where it limits. But when you're saying knowing your boundaries, you're like, yeah, that's not probably something that I would like to do and keen in on, on, on being an empath. So just some great points that I, that I wanted to call out that you had just covered. I knew pretty quickly after some experiences that I was fine closing certain doors. <laughs> Lesioning portions of the brain out of rats was, was definitely one of them. I don't think I disagree with you on that one. Based on what we just covered, what would you say to your younger self now, being where you are, how you could have perhaps accelerated that process? I know you had talked about the, there was some trepidation in terms of what you wanted to do. And then when you got into college and talking with professors and finding that out, is there anything that you would be able to share with your younger self of how you could have accelerated the process? Oh man, that's a great question. I, I really don't know because I think I look back at that experience and although it wasn't something that always made my parents comfortable because they wanted that path to be accelerated, like you said, or maybe more efficient, I feel like I learned a ton through that process though. I even thought about political science once as a career. And then I realized, I don't know if I want to be a politician or a lawyer. Although I still think law would have been fun. No, oh. I really don't know that I would have done anything to speed it up because my whole claim to why I've been able to do what I've been, been doing is patience. I'm okay with taking my time in my career and making those types of decisions that ultimately give you a, a direction. So I appreciate that. It's like that uh, all roads lead to Rome. Even with the patients, believe it or not, I think that if you were to look at your career, and we'll, and we'll talk about this later, but I'd like to put a pin in this to come back to it, is that perhaps that patience during that period helped to actually accelerate your career later on. Yeah, I think so. This is what caught my attention. One of the things you defined out early what you don't want to do. And then there's this process that you go through to get in the neighborhood of what could be a possibility. So at some point between those two things, you, you probably started asking questions. Okay, how does this work? Or this is what I like to do. One of the things that's been a common theme amongst other folks that we've talked to is that if you don't have a community of people around you to point you a certain way, you got to build that on your own. And what caught my attention about your comment about your professor that opened the possibilities of where you could go is that's an ad hoc community. LB calls it his board of directors that he sometimes refers back to, to give you a view into it. So mm -hmm. when you're thinking about, there's no shortcut for experience because it's only through experience, your career hacks or whatever you want to call it is going to come from your ability to build a set of advisors around you to give you input and use as a sounding board. And it seems like that was what the role that the professor played in pointing you through those couple different paths where you had the clinical option or you had the business option that you could go through. A ton of professors at that university help form that decision for me ultimately. And it was interesting. It was 
not that long ago, maybe five or so years ago, I was back in my hometown. Actually, I think it was when we were wedding planning and I gave my then fiance, my now husband, a tour of the university. And we walked up to the psychology department and I was just showing him around where the labs were and things like that. And it happened to be one of the professors there that day. And he recognized me and actually started to recall work that we did in his lab. And it was just like, wow, I had no anticipation of running into anybody, let alone that they would remember me after the thousands of students that they've seen over, you know, that last decade or so. And I credit that community of advisors and those trusted folks that really did help provide some perspective, advice, whatever it was. I still do the same thing as a mom. Like I, I have to have a community of advisors to keep me sane and support you through all of the things that happen as a mom with two little kids. So I have no shame in that. No, no ego too big to exclude advice from folks who have been there, done that before me. During our advertisements for the show, as we talk about the ways in which you, you know, accelerate your uh, career. And that's in fact, one of the ways that you, you do it, right? You actually, you lean on experienced folks that have already done it. Why, why reinvent the wheel? And, and there are times where, you know, I will share with people, well, getting the experience and hearing someone's perspective, you may go, oh, okay, great. And, and you decide to go in a different direction because you recognize that it may be different, but with something like uh, parenting and being a new mom, as you indicate, and my, those days for me are long since gone, but it was way better to talk to someone that gave me advice as opposed to reading the books that may or may not have hit them. Yeah, I've never been much of a reader. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> I, I gained so much more from conversations and really leaning on folks who, like I said, have walked that journey before I am. I, I may be jumping way ahead, but you said you're not much of a reader. So do, do you podcast? Yes, I find time and multitask with podcasts much easier. Yeah. I think that we, we talk, again, we talk about the different ways that are at our uh, disposal now to be able to do it. And when you have two little people running around, it's a very different conversation about podcasting, listening versus being able to focus and read. Focus is, is hard to come by these days. So one of the things that I wanted to dig in on, and, and this is going to be a, a theme that comes up when we get into the professional journey component of your story, is patience. Uh, there's no substitute for it. And you've been deliberate about deploying that you know, throughout your journey. The question that I have is that you're coming out of a small town background and there's a set of expectations in terms of how things are quote unquote supposed to be, or how your life is supposed to travel coming out of that environment. How did you manage the weight of those expectations with your need to being patient and, and letting things evolve? as I needed. I don't know that I can, I actually know how I did it. Cause I know there were times that were hard. My friends were getting jobs that's really steady paychecks. And I was doing a honors thesis instead in between undergrad and graduate school. I, I think that was the hardest year to be honest, because I knew I needed to pad my resume in order to get into a quality grad program. So I did a, an extra year or maybe it was just a semester. I can't remember now, but to do an honors thesis, to do my own research project so that I could have a really strong application and get into a good school. That was so difficult. Applying to all of these grad programs while everybody else was not only getting jobs, but maybe even getting engaged or getting married. And I'm actually like, at that time in my life, running from a, a relationship because I was afraid that it was leading to marriage. And I was like, I'm not ready for this. Like I need to go focus on my, my career and, and, and do some things before I think about that life step. And there were times it was definitely hard. I would say, especially in my later twenties, when I was still in grad school and working on my comprehensive exams and thinking about proposing a dissertation. And by that time, Many of my friends had been married and if not already having kids and they've got 401ks and I didn't even know what that was in grad school. I didn't need to worry about that because there was no option for it. It was hard at times, I think, to have had a different focus in my 20s than so many of my peers. But again, if, if I had to look back, I would have told myself to do exactly what I did. I think I did the right thing for me. I certainly wouldn't have the career I have today had I not pursued and spent so much time in school. My husband actually made the joke today. He's like, 
you could be a doctor. You know that. I knew that wasn't for me either. I ruled doctor out a long time ago. I, I think patience was the thing that served me well. And just keeping my head down and not letting it be too distracting as, as folks were hitting other significant milestones in their lives. And I wasn't. And also being in grad school helped. I had a really amazing cohort and we were all going through it together. And they had the same experiences with folks from their hometowns and we could lean on each other to, to say that's their path, but this is ours. So it's always surrounding yourself with people who are like-minded, even if it's a small group to have your close connections. What you, what you just mentioned is another great point because this whole idea and notion of, is something that I think people miss holding on to, or quite frankly, maybe they never establish. Uh, a thing that's a cohort, but cohort is formalized as a, as a group of individuals that go through an academic program together in most cases by definition. But I think that there is still an opportunity to create that, that sort of support system that you talk about that helps to normalize what may be at that time for the majority of folks as you're on the fringes, what everybody else was doing that you knew. And then being in a group with another set of folks that were on the fringe to help to normalize that and help to, I think, support the idea and notion of that patience. Because I think it, it, it's interesting because you say, you say patience, but if anybody's been in a graduate program, it's anything but patient. It feels like a, a, you're just an absolute frenzy all out. The bottom drops out from under you kind of thing. And yet it, there is some of that, right? There is some amount of you, you have to be able to take a step back, take a deep breath. And then reapproach. Great call outs there. I was just as I was listening, I'm like, wow, she's saying a lot in a short period of time. And we haven't even gotten to the world of work yet. I think we're in for a pretty phenomenal part two of the conversation. But I think if we're looking at the almost hour that we spent talking, I think the big takeaway that I get from your story, Sarah, is that I don't think anybody should be going into their journey under the weight of somebody else's expectations. And I know that theoretically, that's easier said than done, but it, it's really true from your story. You have what is quote unquote, the path that's laid out based on where you are a at some point, the earlier you can surround yourself with people that say, Hey, this is not the direction that you have to go. And it's okay to figure things out. That's a critical lesson that people should adopt. And, and we haven't even gotten into how did that manifest itself in your career? So great. It's a great conversation so far. And I'm really looking forward to the second half of the conversation where we actually see that vocation, that impact that you got from watching your mom's example, how that plays out in your career journey, your leadership journey, how that impacts team dynamics, all that stuff. So it's, it's going to be a great part two. Yeah, I look forward to it. That winds down part one. So for those of you that tune in, make sure you are seeking Sarah out on LinkedIn. I'm sorry, I'm just putting all your business out there, Sarah. <laughs> We got to, we got to build a community. So if you want to follow Sarah's professional journey, if you want to get advice and, and build your ad hoc community, which is what Sarah did when she was coming up, I would suggest definitely connect with any and all of us, but especially including Sarah. So that way you have the, the, the wisdom of those that have gone before you to speed up your path. So thanks again for, for joining. Make sure you follow us on all your favorite podcasting platforms, tune in. We will have part two where we really see the acceleration of Sarah's impact and how that leadership journey takes flight and takes form throughout her career. Thanks for joining us. Until next time. Thanks, guys.